you would say, oh yeah, there's other, there's other brands than Berkey, right? But in fact, I'm not aware of a brand that's guaranteed to the level of Berkey. It's an important source of money. How do you spell it, Berkey? D E R K E Y. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Ah, yeah. oh, yes. I'm sorry. Here's the box. No, I am not a representative or salesman, and I make sure I'm not so that I have credibility. I'm trying to help people here. And we have never sold. We don't know each other, you see. Oh, yeah, the word did it. No, but I don't believe there's any other brand that has the highest level of quality that you need. And some people say that these last virtually forever. There's a way to clean the filter with vinegar. Do you know that? Is that true? Um, I don't know. Is so, it, well, the, the is filter it. itself, the black element, um, you just you don't even need to clean it or anything. I mean, unless you're going to be using pond water or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, um, we're talking about. You can. <laughs> we're talking about hardcore. Uh, um, they recommend that you clean it out, like the the actual bucket and stuff, with vinegar once a month. Right. And uh, you know, if you're just using it at home, which I do, like, add the fluoride filter on there too, because that that does not actually get old fluoride out, the, the regular black element. Mm -hmm. They have a fluoride one for that. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna, as far as the black filter itself, cleaning it, I think they just, from what I remember, it just you know, rinse it off, right? I don't know if you can or not, but I guess you could. <laughs> That's what I heard, but I know about the inside of these ones. So uh, it's supposed to, if you maintain it, does last years. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain amount of they, they guarantee it for a certain number of uses, which is a lot. Yeah, thousands of gallons. Thousands of gallons. But then, oh, here's Sally. Come on in. Okay, no work for time. So, uh, right on Helen's Big Mac, and she was a great herbalist. And I uh, had two other of my friends who were, you know, kind of has expertise in this, put this book together. Now, herbs are good for when you prevent any kind of sickness. There are Native Americans here in this region, which are Muncie Indians. You uh, can get more specific if you want. But um, they use herbs every day. They use herb teas. They use uh, the herbs in salads, so to speak, and uh, soups, too. And they also use tree bark, which this book doesn't go into. This book goes into just the herbs, there are 80 different herbs that went in her yard, and each herb has several different medical applications. And so just in her yard, she had 80 herbs with several hundred different uh, solutions, health solutions. And it doesn't work unless you use them. You use them every day. So in the old days, people had herb teas every day. But basically, there was water. And the water, fresh water, is very important to drink. And again, that's why this is key today. Um, and especially more now than ever because of Fukushima. But, but this is uh, my contribution. We're not talking about Earth today. We're going to talk about something that is above and beyond anything we have here, and that is the real deal. The real core problem is protein, right? And what do you eat? Because a lot of the store-bought foods that you're used to won't necessarily grow in this environment for more than a few years. You have to think about that. So what is indigenous plants, what do they look like, and how do you collect them? Um, what I have in part of my slideshow here is the academic <coughs> view, so to speak, of what was historically done in this very region, what were the plants that were edible in this region, what were they called? The reason why I include the Native American names is if it doesn't have a Native American name, it's suspect as being an indigenous plant. And if it does have a Native American name, you can be sure it's indigenous, and that's part of why I put indigenous names on each of these. You may not be interested in the okay. But um, also, when you see the number of plants that are edible and collectible, you think, oh my gosh, how could I live on that? So, okay, let's go to plan B. Plan B is those little furry critters that we all adore. They look pretty good, I suppose, after you've just been eating, you know, sedum for a month. So, we go right on to the game. And again, Tony here as a Quite knowledgeable goes back his whole life. He's been really living close to the land in every way. So um, what I thought to do is give a joint presentation that would have my, you know, the structure is alphabetical, by the way, go through the edible plants, no herbs, just plants, and then go into the animals. If you want to know about herbs, this is a pretty good intro. There's other books, of course, that are introduction to herbs, but this is 
the mic. Can everybody hear me okay? Like a bell. Like a bell. Like a bell. Like a bell. Thank you. All right. So, any questions so far? Okay, good. And uh, so, what I'm going to do is show you alphabetically go through the, the different plants and you'll see what they look like. But first of all, um, talking about the foods of the hunter-gatherers, which are the people living off the land. And all the foods that you know, we eat at Thanksgiving. What? Yeah, Tony. Um, my name is Tony Moonhawk. I'm um, a child in Paul Monkey. And I lived in the area here all my life. My wife, she's around Paul and Mokosuki. And everybody here who lives in the area here? Mm -hmm. Okay. If, the, if anything happened with power and all that, everybody in this room would never go starving. You not lose weight. And you would be able to survive and die living in this area because there's all kinds of food, as I was going to show you. To survive. There's ways of surviving. There's water. All the water we have here, the rest of the country wants it. But we have it here. And it's drinkable. We can go outside right now and take you to some of those streams. We can drink the water with no effect. We can survive. So, um, there was a, um, we had, the Rempo had a lawsuit with Ford with the chemicals in the land. And all these big time lawyers from Manhattan used to come up to the area and they were amazed. They said a hour and a half ride, they thought they went back in time. They didn't know anything of the woods, of the forest. They saw eagles, they saw the bears, and they thought, you know, they were back in 200 years ago. You know, so um, it's it can be done. You know, it can be done. Yes, we done. So what I wanted to go ahead and show you uh, about in terms of estuaries, estuaries are very important parts of understanding how we can relate to the land as a food source. And the ancient Algonquins, when judging by the place names when you translate them, were able to kind of break down an estuary into 17 or so harvest zones with different kinds of foods expected in each of the zones. I won't spend a whole lot of time on this. But, you know, water is, is Bodies of water are important places to find food. And so you have, you have a harbor, and again, there's different Algonquin names, I won't go into that, but there's the name tell people where to uh, eat, so to speak. Mud flats would have a certain kind of, uh, you know, foods available. Uh, sea water here, this is salty, this is brackish, and this is fresh. You can tell me different kinds of fishing. There's a, a waterfall here which divides pure drinking water from brackish water, so you have both kinds of environments together. Plus there are places where you find uh, stony, uh, stony kinds of environments right next to uh, more uh, soil, well, hummus, uh, not hummus, what's the word? Hummus. Hummus. So that you would have two different kinds of plants right next to each other, which is a good place to be if you're foraging. So they have each of these, there's the heads of the waters, usually have a head of tide where that's where the salt front is, and then fresh above that. So they have these different kinds of zones. I just wanted to point that out. And you want a variety of proteins. Oysters by themselves don't give you a complete protein. And, uh, but you can smoke them and eat them in the winter. So this is a, some of, you can see some of the words that are used in Algonquin. And Tony and I and Marcy are all Algonquin stock. So let's start with fruits and vegetables in the area. Do you want to like, shut the lights off? Because it's kind of a small thing. It's like watching TV. Okay, so corn. Wait, this this isn't blocking anybody's view? No. No. Is it? That's good. Okay, well, husqueam is a word for coin, and M means Muncie and W means Waffenders. I'll remind you what these mean, but it's not essential for this talk. But husqueam is the name of the corn mother the great yellow mother, and there's a spiritual component to corn for people of this area. They do ceremony, and corn is uh, it represents abundance because it grows, and you can you know, take one ear of corn, and out of that you can make more corn. But corn is a very complex plant because it's you, know, you have to really keep it uh, carefully cultivated. 
Uh, Indian corn is different, has the multiple colors. You know, here, uh, Wapalum, or Sao Amen. And so there were three different kinds of corn here when Henry Hudson arrived 400 years ago. <coughs> Indian corn, like you see, Turkish wheat, and, and also maize. These are three different kinds of corn. And these are the indigenous kinds that are more likely to last. But um, again, it's really, I don't know, I'm not an expert in growing corn, but there are many people in the community who are. And it just doesn't, you just, it's not that simple with corn. It's an important protein. Do you want to comment on corn at all? Yeah, um, it was stable. It's, uh, for us, we used it for everything. Uh, you can make bread out of it. You can make soup out of it. Yeah, uh, it's all kinds of stuff. You can do it for breading other animals. You know, um, my grandmother used to say it's, it's one. And uh, a Chinese uh, artichoke. Mm. Chinese artichoke. Okay, the fourth is like a mint. The fourth is. Oh, you're welcome. Um, well, the mint would only be a full sister, but this is like a forest garden thing. It's not a real three sisters, uh -huh. but they cliched it, the uh, perennial three sisters with the Jerusalem artichoke, Chinese artichoke, and the, the ground nut. Well, um, Hawkins is another kind of the, that ground nut. Which ground nut? Uh, it's the bean. Uh -huh. um, so it, it's um, the most known is um, Hawkins or ground nut. But I know there are a lot of remnants around the world, so... Well, right, there's a whole... Indigenous here. Right, well, the word, uh, you know, we use, um, like, ground nut is a generic term we use for all of the ground nuts. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's why I say all, all the ones that words. fall on the ground. Yeah. You know, we eat all, all of those. <coughs> so, jewelry. Now, this is one of my favorites. Um, you know, the uh, jewelry, of course, they grow near the uh, poison ivy, right? a good uh, remedy for poison ivy, but in September, about the first or second week of September, uh, depending on your altitude, they grow in uh, an abundance, they develop these pods, like you see here. This is a jewelweed pod. And as, if you're just starting to forest and you want something easy, start with the jewelweed pods. Uh, find, like, up a mountainside, along a paved road or a trail, see where you find any jewelweeds. And you'll recognize them as a flower, but also this pod, what you do is they explode. And uh, I mean, not to blow your hand off, but they tickle. <laughs> so you grab them and hold them in your hands, and eventually they pop. And so what happens is the seeds actually are ejected from the pod very forcefully. And if you can capture them in your hand, then you just eat them. Mm. Uh, they taste like walnuts again, just like the dandelion fruit, some of the same flavor. The, the delicate, a much more, I mean, the dandelion roots have a coarseness to them, but these are a delicacy, and they're quite abundant in our area, like I say, in Mountain Road, around September 10th <coughs> to the 20th, depending on your altitude. They, they create the pods, they develop the pods a little later at high altitudes, and at low altitudes a little earlier. So the whole first half of September, try, go out looking for this as you want. If you're new to foraging, it's easy picking. So you can actually get a lot of them in your hand at some point, but then some of them will just explode. They'll kind of detonate when you're not looking. And so even afterwards, there's little tiny seeds and then in your hand. Then you eat all of them. You just eat them like that. And some people like to gather them in buckets and whatnot, but then there's a likelihood some will explode in the bucket. Uh, but these are really a treat delicious, extremely nutritious. They don't fill you up. They also have a little bit of that peppery green flavor that I'm sure you're familiar with when you forage. It's a lot of grassy uh, plants with greens and you eat. There's a peppery taste and that's almost like what Mother Nature tastes like is that peppery taste. It's just a little tiny bit of that but it's not so much that it, that it bothers you. It shouldn't bother you unless you are unusually sensitive to it. How do you make it uh, help poison ivy? Do you know about that? You rub it off? You just take the pod or the, the plant stalk, or the, the flower? Stalk, the stalk. The stalk, the, uh, the, the fluid inside, you rub it off. You have to destroy the plant. Yeah. Yeah.
those, you probably offer tobacco in our tradition because you're just writing the plant. You stem like this, mm -hmm. and then the juice is from inside and throw it out. Kind of like an aloe vera? Yeah. Yeah, yeah very so, close. Yeah. And put it right on your um, poison right ivy. Right on the yeah. And they grow near the poison ivy, which is one of those little things that, you know, our tradition is we point and say, see, the universe is intelligent, nature is intelligent, because why else would the jewelry be next to the poison ivy? Yeah, they give the immunity. Now we talk about maple trees, a uh, very big part of the uh, <coughs> asinaminchi means that the wood is as hard as a rock. And sgueo basant means that it's the color of, the, the leaves are the color of blood. The tree would believe the color of blood. And uh, they didn't use the buckets, but they would carve channels in the side of the tree and let the sap run down. And uh, there's all these different traditions cutting them before sunup. Now, the time of year, by the way, if you remember this, is there are times when the temperature rises above freezing and below freezing on the same day. There, it depends. This year we had a long maple season because it was a long cold winter, and there was a long period when it, the temperatures were rising above freezing in the day and going below freezing at night. So we had a very big maple uh, syrup season because that's what makes the sap run up and down, and that's what makes it come out into the buckets. And there's all kinds of uh, 50 gallons a day, uh, some, I mean, it's a quart of syrup, you can get more than that. Um, there's usually three phases. The first phase is, is dull tasting and kind of off color, and then it gets more sweet. The uh, second and the third is the best, they say. Do you have any? It's off, it's off of this. Uh, you can just poke a hole in it and get it, get it out. Yeah. In the tree? Yeah, my, my father used to um, take a, uh, you know, like a spike. The spike in, and pull it out. Not all the way. He didn't want to go to the root, but maybe a couple of inches, mm -hmm. and it would come out. And then what he did, just stick his mouth up there, put a bucket. No, he got a cup. And put it in a, a cup. cup. Yeah, in jars. Yeah. We would say it lasts all the man two years. How long does it take to get in the cup? Not long, or is it just like slow uh, out? No, it drips out. It drips. drinks the water, right? Do we yeah. drink the sap water? Mm -hmm. It drips out. To, to make it into maple syrup takes a longer process involving heat. Mm -hmm. <coughs> five, gallons, five gallons of the watery sap, mm -hmm. you boil it and keep, just boil it down. Five gallons will make you like that much syrup. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's a process, but... Yeah, that's why it's so expensive. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it yeah, it doesn't come out like a faucet. It comes out slow. Remember, the syrup has some of the highest <coughs> concentration of iron and magnesium. Marshmallow plant? I'm not. Never seen it. Expert. It's considered either a food or an herb, depending. And it's in the. But, but they use it for flavoring. Mulberry is very common yeah. in this area. Our mm -hmm. local people use them a lot and like them and identify with them culturally. And they're good, and you know, you can make mulberry yep. jam and pies and things. Talk about yeah. mulberry juice. You can eat them just like that off the tree. Yeah. 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 Squash them, mash them, and all kinds of stuff you can make out of them. Okay. Onion grass. We, this is the time of year for onion grass. You don't have to use the bulbs. You can use the grass alone. And sometimes you're trying to pull it up. It's hard to get the bulbs up sometimes. But you can use the grass in a salad. Yep. It's good for salads. If you ever go cut your grass, you smell the onion you smell. That's probably the wild onions we call them. As kids, we just like to chop them up and eat it. It's really is, it, is that with scallions in there? Yeah. Like, like that. Yeah, yeah, they're like small scallions. Yeah. But they're really, they're, yeah. it's really what, Once you know them, they're, they're all over the place in your yard. Yeah. All over my yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they grow wild. They're flavorful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, they say that's the gift of the deer because gift, the deer don't eat onion grass. Mm -hmm. And if they did, we wouldn't be able to eat much of it. But they leave it for us. Mm -hmm. No but yeah, you can use the grass as a kind of a scallion, or you can just use the bottoms as onions. Pawpaws, anybody ever seen these around? Yeah. Down further south where I grew up, we had a lot of these. And uh, again, a lot of people recognize them. You know, there's a well, women's name also, some women were called Pawpaw, right? Yes. We know about Pawpaw. Is that any comment? Yeah. Um, she's named up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we just I don't I'm not sure what what how would you compare them at this point I guess 
Yeah, you can eat them raw, right? You peel it, take the seeds out, and you can make like a mango, just like a mango. Like so fresh, yeah. It's, it's like a meteor, like a, a meteor fruit. Mm -hmm. so it has it's firmer than mango. mango. No, but it's like, you know how mango is, and you can scoop it in right, That's right. kind of that texture. Oh, okay. It's okay. yeah. a little firm. It has an off, off taste. I can't describe it. Like, right. Okay. It's almost like a unsweet pudding. Almost. Yeah, like the, uh, like yeah. the nasty custard. Mm -hmm. the yeah, it's a custard. Yeah, it's yeah, custard. fall off the trees. Mm -hmm. You got it. Yeah, Wow, wow. There's that song way down on under five, 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 Right. Yeah. 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 So it's firmer than mango, but um, yeah, they see them around a lot. The persimmons also yes, grow there. Right. Yeah. The pop and the persimmon are indigenous, and you can find them here, and they'll continue to grow even after we're gone. Yes. They use them for like tomatoes. Yeah. They're good with salt. Salt. Yeah. Oh, Frank Mites, this is a uh, kind of, I guess, people. Not sure what to make of Phragmites, but uh, very common, and it is like uh, some people say there was a way that were they were eaten. Some researchers, some natives say that their ancestors ate these. But I'm not sure how. They're like a wheat or something. Pine nuts. I grew up eating pine nuts. Did you eat pine nuts? No. We have. You can buy them in the store by another name, but um, they are very good to eat. And who was San Kamen is the native word of Wapinger. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they were very small, their pinion pines, and they could be so small east of the Mississippi that they were very difficult to harvest. But out west, they're much larger, and that's the ones you buy in the store uh, by another name. Pinyol is the thing. Okay, now we're getting back to the controversy about mushrooms. Mm -hmm. Uh, deer like the puffballs, um, so there was none left for us. Um, so Native Americans lived in balance with these deer, and hunting out the deer could lead to a, a meat shortage, but too little deer hunting could bring an end to foraging. So it's a balance again. And puffballs, personally, I'd be careful. There is a mushroom north of here that we found, I can't remember the name, <coughs> research it. It grows like a big eggplant. There's a native lady, she brings it to the Powell to do it all this every year. She, it grows wild. Wow. And then we always <coughs> just like that, fuck them out as a kid when we were little. Mm -hmm. the, the head? Or just yeah, the petals. leaves, the yellow. The petals. The petals. Mm -hmm. And the leaves you plant them and they'll grow some petals. Uh -huh. Yeah, sprouts are really good for you too. Like you eat the whole sprout. Oh, of course. Yeah, man, definitely the sprouts. It's one of the best sprouts of all. Of the indigenous sprouts, it's probably the best one. And again, I mentioned strawberries. We call them in Nicmac etchumen. And uh, these are full of, you know, they're very good for you. You want to talk about any, anything any more about strawberries? Because these are indigenous to these coasts. Mm -hmm. um, they're good to eat. They grow everywhere. So you, uh, once you start them out, they're hard. But once they take root, they grow like a weed. You can't stop them from growing. You know, my grandma used to, and she loved them at first, but then they became a nuisance for her. Because every time she went outside, they were outside, she stuck them, they would tread them all over the house. But um, yeah, but, um, you can eat them for everything. You know how in the store they're like big as golf balls? You won't find them in the wild that big. They're very small. small. Wild strawberries are small. And don't think, oh, I'll wait till it grows. You know, just pick them when you can. Right? Because some of them are very small and they can just go The wild ones. So that's what you're going to find. And again, tiger lilies or day lilies. There's a number of parts of it you can eat, right? The leaves and salads. And again, I'm Helen told the tourists, oh yeah, you can eat those things. And then you wake up the next morning and they're all gone, you know. I didn't know. Yeah, they're all over the place. They're like squash blossoms. Are you curious about how you prepare them? Anyways. How would you prepare a tiger lily? Well, you eat them raw. Just like the whole flower or the stalk? No, the flower part. The flower part. Okay. Okay. Here's what I'm telling. She says, "Day lily, hemerocallus fulva, young shoots, yeah. flower buds, and tubers." Mm -hmm. The tubers oh. are used. They're found in waste ground, 
and they escape from gardens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're used in salads, in cooked greens, fritters, in other words, fried, the white flour, and they're used as seasoning. And a tea made from the root is used to treat diarrhea and gonorrhea, by the way. And roots, when ground to a soapy consistency, is soothing when spread on swellings and sores. So there's a lot that Helen has to say about that. And she always had the last word. And two birds will go to the left. There was violets. I just had a lot of violets over it. We had a, a foraging workshop of the World of Gate Farm. And uh, what was the name of the foraging? Dina Falcone. Falcone. And she had us go out and pick violets. Yeah, they're good. The leaves. There were about 20 people that went out foraging with her, under her guidance. And they came out with a feast for about 50 people all together. Well, they added. Well, they added. Yeah. Okay. But you can eat the. But this is the heart-shaped leaf. You don't really get a really good look at the leaves, but they're very, they're delicious. The leaves. They're heart-shaped. And the wild carrot. Again, any comments on anybody? Wild carrot. You be careful about. It. It should smell like a, a carrot, because otherwise it's extremely <laughs> dangerous if you get the similar look like. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, Queen Anne's lace. Anne's lace. That, that's also called Queen Anne's lace. Yeah. But the other variety, I. Hemlock, boys and hemlock. Hemlock, yes. Hemlock looks almost the same, and yeah. takes you out. So be very careful with wild carrot, but it is the natives would be able to eat that, and so you smell it, right? And you only want to eat it in the springtime before it flowers, and that'll be the root. So you got to know what the plant looks like when it's young. It, it's a biennial, so you want the first year, not what the second year when the flower happens. Yep. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, grape, this is very popular among the natives, and uh, they were offered to Henry Hudson when he arrived and, uh, as a delicacy. So it's two stages here, muscadine. Um, you know, they didn't cultivate, like, conquered grapes necessarily, but they cultivated these. Did they come? Because they're smaller, they do more bitter. Okay, so these are the edibles. And, of course, wild rice. You all probably heard about Indian rice. Yeah. And there's a certain way. You notice this person has a stick in their right hand and wild rice stalks in the left hand. And if you <coughs> get greedy and you're pulling them off, what you're pulling off is probably unripe uh, rice kernels that will taste terrible and never really be right. But if you tap them into your bucket or your the bottom of your canoe in this case, which is traditional, right. then the ones that drop off are ripe and very delicious. Yeah. <coughs> They're not pulling the whole plant out, he's just taking the, the rice out. Mm -hmm. So what he's doing, he's, he's bending it over, he's, bend, he's not pulling the root out of the water, out of the ground, right. he's just getting the rice out by hitting it with the stick. And then he lets go and the rice goes, the rice yeah. stock goes back up, yeah. and then it still has unripe rice right. kernels on it. So you can go back and get more later on. It helps it regenerate. Mm -hmm. So that's Indian rice, and you can get that at the store in a little dark box. You know, yeah, it's kind of brown, but it's good. Yeah, it's good. It's a little grainier. Yeah, it's a little grainier. Okay. Now here's the decision we have to make. That was most of the edible indigenous plants that you're going to find, exception for very little known or rare plants. So you think, well, that's not a whole lot, is it? Right. So then you might want to turn to hunting and fishing, and the question I want to ask you is how much of I mean, it's already after, what, 9 o'clock. How much of this do you want to see? Do you want to go through it quickly? Or do you want to end here, or what do you want to do? Because we've seen almost all the plants you're going to find. Can you go through it quickly? Quick, quick, quick. Okay. Well, he has some really hilarious stories. Okay, so, Shad? Okay. Jump in if you want to. Shad, that's a Shad Row. They're very common about here. Blackberry is a food. I saw one at Whirly Gate Farms, by the way. That area. Black bear? I saw Blackberry, yeah, that's why they had all this. Yeah, mm -hmm. right before the foraging. So I told the men, the men went out, and they were standing there guarding you guys. You didn't even know. Yeah, they were around here. Okay, beaver. Sure, beavers are very common. Uh, getting, they're coming back, and um, they. They eat the tails and the delicacy, the whole beaver, the whole gamey. They're, you know, they're rodents. And oily. And oily, yeah. But I've eaten a lot of beaver, and people have all these different homemade tricks of how to make them a little less gamey. And usually salt water is involved, you know, letting them sit and brine. But the tails are a delicacy. 
clam supports, as you know. Uh, blue crab is indigenous to the area. Crayfish are indigenous. This one has eggs. And then what was it? Uh, you put Tony, you told me that you put meat on a string, you put it in water, and they grab on. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you know, we kids, you can um, anything, chicken, meat, whatever you have, and tie it on a rope, and that's how you were catching them. They grab on, and they can pull them right out the water. White tailed deer, of course, you know, eating venison, following the tracks. Mm -hmm. Duck decoys were used to help hunt ducks. Mm -hmm. Duck is good, uh, you know, kind of meat. Eels were a very big uh, thing. Nishawag, by the way, is the wild fish word. They're like, the eels, the word for Nishawa means it's like, Nishawa, it's like they're like two people because they have two phases in life where they're very different in the, in the Sargasso, where they're very passive and then they come up here and they're very aggressive and they walk on the land. Mm -hmm. And um, so eels taste like chicken, they really do. And you fry them in the pan. But they can also spew you, they can shoot you with this kind of, you know, Ghostbusters, the, you know, they have the plasma. It's a little bit like that, it's kind of easy. <laughs> but they taste like chicken. It's not they, but it's lion. Okay, garter snakes are edible. Rat snake. You said it wasn't half bad, Tony. Not half bad. But you didn't mention how the other half tasted, did you? Okay, any kind of snake. And make good foods. By the way, you'll see this in a minute. But all eggs taste basically similar. So any egg you find, if you really want to eat it, fry it up just like any other chicken ball. Squalens, who's um, Tastes like gamey sardines crossed with rabbit meat. Mm. Mm. You've had it though, right? Mm. Some people eat them all the time. I got an uncle who eats them all the time. It's between chicken and lobster. Oh, okay, now look. Woodchuck. Woodchuck, yes. You didn't know where that word comes from. It's the Lenape word, woodchuck. Woodchuck. Okay, so there's a, uh, you talk about wild lettuce or skunk cabbage, mm -hmm. and uh, make a stew. Yep. So how did he, how did your father trap them? Uh, he go down the hole, he reached down in the hole, and he paid them out. He put the, um, no. the, uh, they dig big holes, and then he would put the cage inside the hole, and when the ground will go in there, he gets trapped in the cage. <laughs> the lettuce, right? Uh, herrings. Uh, lots of herrings. In the old days now, they're just in a few tributaries. Mm -hmm. Ulster County's Black Creek has apparently herrings. And they are delicious. Lobsters grew to seven feet in the old days. Wow. And the Brooklyn uh, was the aquatic, what do they call it, the marine, you know, what's that thing called? Aquarium. Yes. And Coney Island. They, they're trying to grow them to five or six feet, mm -hmm. but they say they really don't grow as old as they used to. Um, so the age is a factor. They put them in the ocean, and the pollution kills them. But if they're in a cage, it's too confining, and they don't grow to seven feet. Mm -hmm. But lobsters are naturally big, and a lot of meat can be had from lobsters in the old ways. Mm -hmm. And the uh, native people ate them. The newt is edible. Mm -hmm. If you're hungry, there it is. There's dinner. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oysters, of course, the best oysters in the world used to be in our area, and they're making a comeback, and hopefully. I guess after many years with no electricity, maybe uh, maybe the oysters will be completely restored. They'll be they're bivalve, so they again soak in all the toxins. Mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm sure some of the older women, the ladies, know about cooking with corn. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. so, but for um, but for us, it was um, it's, it's it's important for us for our people. Now they use uh, sometimes the antlers in the old days to scrape off the corn into the bowl and you know use it that way or dry it and then grind it. Right, you dry it out, you can grind it. Uh, all you need is a couple of rocks to grind it. I have a, a mortar and pestle, and, but I lent it to somebody, so I don't have to. I'm going to turn it on. A mortar and pestle, you know, grinding. Sometimes they have them right in the land where you can create a mortar and pestle out of the land itself. You have a big rock that has an indentation. You put, you scrape it with the angler, you put the corn kernels in the hollow, and then you get a big stone to grind it. 
the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania. We do a lot of uh, festivals and powwows there. And the kids, they go out and they go swimming. And every time they come back, they come back with a flat rock and an L-shaped rock. Okay, every time, every year we go. And um, it's just fine. It looks like a, a literally an L and a flat bowl rock. You can work on it. You know, it's in the river, the Susquehanna. So when they grind it, they turn that into bread. And the bread is good for travel. And you ever heard of Johnny Cake? <laughs> That's from New England. It's, it's really Johnny Cake. Like you go on a Johnny, you go on a long Johnny, right? And you take your Johnny Cake. And Southerners thought it was Johnny, that's the guy's name. And you probably had a uh, strawberry shortcake sometime in your life. That is a Native American invention because strawberries really only indigenously grow on the east and west coast of the United States. That's where they originated. And so it's our east and west natives who develop strawberry shortcake, taking the uh, cornmeal, cornbread, and uh, using like deer fat or whatever, or whipping it up and then putting the strawberries in. So that is a Native American dish. And you can look that up in uh, the New England cookbook, mm -hmm. Yankee cookbook. So, mm -hmm. Arrowroot is good. Masana tupic. Tupic is root. And again, it's Muncie for M. And our, again, Muncie is this whole area of Native Americans in the Ramapo are also have a Muncie foundation. All the way from Socrates, all the way down to the Raritan River is Muncie Indian Territory that people sometimes say is Lenape. I don't know, everybody has a different opinion about that. But the Muncie are a very large group, had the best land in the country, and there was, could have been 40 to 50,000 Muncie uh, contact. However, now you don't really hear a whole lot about it. It doesn't mean they're not here, it just means that, you know, there's a lot of things you don't know about. A lot of you probably didn't know that. The, uh, you know, when I, I don't know more was going on in Canada. How many people knew it was going on? Well, well, I'm sorry, See, we still don't know, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was a huge, uh, kind of a quiet revolution in Canada from coast to coast last year called I Don't Know More. And everybody was involved, and every town was involved, and there were blockades on all the roads. And it was to protest fracking and, and tar sands operations in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you, a whole other seminar, but you didn't hear about it. You also don't hear about Muncie's, because wow. they really own Manhattan, and Manhattan's in a treaty. So the Ramapo are related, are based on a Muncie foundation. Right? Yes. So, not that he's going to take Manhattan. It's not that <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, the other thing with Manhattan being bought it up, it wasn't sold. There's a there's an old rumor about Manhattan being sold for sixty dollars. It was sixty. It was sixty barrels of supplies, and it wasn't. The, uh, um, the English came and they wanted to use the land rights for hunting. So, you know, you trade off. Okay, and I'm thinking now it's good to bring it up because, this is, you know, you guys do a lot of trade. Okay, but if Manhattan, uh, they wanted the land rights to go hunting. So they said, okay, well, what do you have to trade? They said, okay, we have this, that, that. And everything they bought was 60 barrels of supplies, blankets, uh, tools, uh, weapons. Okay, so now once they got there, they took it over, they put a fence up and blocked the Indians out of it. And they said that that was the deal that they had, but that wasn't the deal, you know. But everybody says, oh, so they sold Manhattan for $60. It wasn't $60. Now let's talk about Everroot. Now I know you, you eat these raw sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when you eat them raw? Is there any digestive problem? Is it it's, it's bitter. It's bitter? It's okay. bitter, yeah. If you've never had it before, you're not, you know, it, it'll make it give you upset stomach. Mm -hmm. It's better like to boil it, you know. But uh, you can eat it raw, but no problem. A lot of people. Mm -hmm. like potatoes, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, you said the arrows are common, yeah? Do you dry it to use it as a flour? Mm hmm. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good flour. One of your better flours, right? Mm -hmm. Now, beans. Yes. Maize Cousy in Wappinger. Uh, now there's three of the, you know, the three sisters that are grown together, corn, beans, and squash. The corn, the Lenape, you know, Manhattan, other places around here, they would build, they put a dead fish in the ground, they would all put a dead fish, and that creates nutrients and warmth in the early part of the year. And then they have a mound of dirt. Now according to colonials, they had a square base, 
and sometimes almost a foot high. And then when it was just about a, uh, just a few inches tall, then they'd plant the, uh, the beans in the squash, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then they all work together. You want to talk about the corn, beans, and squash now? Yep, it's the three sisters. So, um, three, well, well, three sisters, um, you could have them all together, you could plant them all together, they usually plant them all together. Um, when you say fish, that's how they, they fertilize the ground. A lot of times the ground was, you know, just not fertile, so they would put all kinds of corn, whatever they had left over, the husk, the uh, fish, whatever they had, and the beans would grow strong out of that. You know, they would grow more out of them. That's why they say the three sisters, because most of the time we ate them together, they grew together, you know, and their beans. Yeah. Yeah. Suck cash is what you get when you divide the three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you survive off the, those plants, the three sisters, and not need other foods? For no. the, like a survival food? You could for a, a couple of months, mm -hmm. but then you need protein. You know, medically. Well, you corn would provide protein, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Amino acids, though. So. Yeah, the beans. Yeah, but, the beans, rather. Yeah. yeah, but eventually you would need you know, more than that. Fat. Yeah, you need fat. fat. I mean, it would fill you up, you wouldn't be hungry, but you would get tired of eating it, and um, you need more than that. It could be 90%, but you still have to Well, they have, the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois upstate rely heavily, have relied heavily on the three sisters, <laughs> and they get along, you know, and I think with fish, that would be good. Yep. It is good, yeah. That would be a good combination, keep you going longer. And, um, yeah, the... the the beans have um, nitrogen, right? <coughs> nitrogen helps <coughs> the corn and the, mm -hmm. and the squash is good for keeping the bugs out, covering the ground, covering the ground to keep um, weed suppression. Weed suppression. Uh, so this the squash has quite a number of uses. We're going to see it as a food in a few minutes, but it covers the ground. It shades it and it keeps the heat away yeah. from the young plants. It keeps the bugs away, mm -hmm. and it keeps the weeds out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want the third sister. But we're going to see that's also a food. <coughs> no, I just have a comment. You got protein in plants. Uh, you can look this up. The way we normally ate, I'm a Mahimi, by the way, uh, we did eat the beans, the squash, the corn, but we also had seasons for all the fruits. And we would go pick out on strawberries, blueberries, you name it. Whatever fruit was in season, we eat. We also fished. We ate a lot of fish. Uh, the Mohicans live along the Mohican Park, which is the Hudson River. So we had a varied diet, and I don't see any problem within the future having a varied diet just because we have no power. Because 12,000 years ago, we had the same problem. We left our homeland that we had at the time because we knew it was going to sink, and we moved to the mouth of what's now the Hudson River. And then the day came when the land broke up, and how we lost our power source. We were without power at all. No power whatsoever. But we had already set up our, our, our fields and houses. But we had to live without power. So we have in our stories, they we stayed because we don't like to walk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, again, suck a cash, and you move, put them all together in a form of a soup. That's an Algonquin word. It's good soup. Yeah, you can add fish brains or whatever for fun. Yep. You can add anything. Venison. Ziki le luk and mansi. Blackberries. So uh, I'm going to comment on blackberries. They're plentiful and <coughs> good for a lot of things, including other parts of the plant, right? Um, they're good pies. Okay. And you get, they grow all over. Um, on Long Island, we had a lot of them. The red, the green, and even some of the green wasn't bitter. You could take them down and you could cook with them. Okay. Um, I never tried it, but my grandmother used to tell me whenever there were bug bites or something like that, poison ivy, she would take the uh, greenish part and rub it on and it would stop it from itching. You know? So that was another um, use for it. And the, thorn, uh, uh, the thorns, well, you gotta be careful with it's got some when it gets to the bigger bush, it's got big thorns. Mm -hmm. and the thorns are if you get poked with it, we used to get when we were kids, it's make us it. <laughs> you know? And mm -hmm. um but um you could do a lot of things with, with uh, the berry part. You know? 
And back in the day, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, they used that's what they made the original makeup out of. I don't know if you guys were aware. You know, that was, um, if they were going, the men were going to war, it would be the, well, different tribes, but the darker color would be for like a ninth grade, and the red color would be like a blood feud for another tribe. Would the leaves help with the itching up in the thorns? Never tried it? I never tried it. But my mm -hmm. grandma was small, she said, yeah. So if you get scratched by the blackberry, try the leaves. The leaves. <laughs> the leaves. <laughs> and then tell us. Mm -hmm. They make good hedges, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we're talking about edge, edges, by the way, of um, okay. blueberries and blackberries. But now, how many have ever driven on the Moshulu Parkway? No? Yeah. 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 And you think, oh, it's a Jewish thing, right? No, it's an Agamemnon word, it's a Nabi word, and it means fields that have been cleared by fire. And um, we both talk about this now. I mean, it's an important part. I'm not sure, you know, like if you've got other things to worry about, if that's what you're going to do, it's a little ambitious. But what generally the Aboriginal people do is they will clear you know, a fire road in a triangular shape with a large forest, triangle shaped forest inside, and then they would look to bird signs to know when a storm was, a big storm was about to arrive in about 18 hours or so, or more, is really the only way you can really do that without a weather report, and that takes them practice to read the birds, but then they would light fire to that forest 18 hours before the forest fire, which when the storm arrives, and the, so the trees burn slowly, and then they start to burn a little more, and then the wind kicks up several hours, many hours later, and that increases the fire so they burn almost down, and then comes the rain and puts out all the fire. And then what you have are three edges, and that's the point, the point is the edges, is that that creates an ideal environment for blackberries, blueberries, mm -hmm. and many of the strawberries, and the birds will come flocking to those berries, and the deer will come to eat the mushrooms. By the way, mushrooms are great to have. You gotta make sure you're eating the right ones, but at the edges of the of the Moshalu, or the burned fields, lots of mushrooms obviously come up, and then deer will come. So even if you're not sure about the mushrooms, which ones are good or bad, and, and you know that's a complicated subject, but the deer know, and then you can hunt the deer. So you get a little deer park that way. And you want to talk about the fire uh, at all? Any fire clearing stories? Or didn't really do a lot of that in Long Island, right? It's not appropriate. But uh, watch out for bears. By the way, bears like the blue bears. Maybe you want there. Maybe you're in the mood for some bear meat, but be careful. <laughs> yeah, it's oily. But the, the, there's a, on the back of the bear is some uh, medicine, some bear fat. Cattail, which is in Wappingers would be Wekinash. And uh, all different parts of the cattail are used for food. And you can, it's in my herb book too, but it's really more of a food. Young shoots, rootstocks, immature flowers, spikes, use the pollen, use the sprouts, spring shoots, a syrupy core, you eat them raw in a salad, you can cook it, tastes like asparagus, mm -hmm. filled with starch, prepared as a potato, and dried to make flour. Tastes a bit like cucumber. Um, do you have any comments on cattails? The ones on Long Island, um, if you eat like the, the root pot, they're almost like potatoes. And, it, um, and they're kind of salty, but they were pretty good when we had them. You know, I haven't done it in a couple of years, but I've been meaning to. Is there any difference between different kinds of cattails or yeah. in the season? Yeah, there is. It's mostly in the spring or yeah, in the wait. spring. The spring and um, the fall, but like certain areas, is different. there's different tastes to them. I don't know the names of the different cocktails, but the, um, whatever area it is, it has a, it's funny, it has a certain taste in each area. Do they replenish themselves? Or do you yeah, know? They, yeah, they, yeah, they grow like a weed, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't wet, it's like a moist area, you know, like a mm -hmm. swampy yeah, kind they, of area. They need like a swampy area, yeah. Do you ever use them as a torch? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can light them up as a torch. They burn kind of quick, though. It, um, the, soup, the longer you wait, they'll burn them. The, they dry out, they burn quick. And then you can make spears out of them, too, for the kids. Kids can throw them with spears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
So is there any <coughs> substance you can put on them to make them burn slower? Like a pine resin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, the pine makes them grow the fast, the burn fast. Mm -hmm. uh, they probably is mm -hmm. more. The AH, LHB, for those of you who came in, <laughs> on Helen, a little herb book, I have a section in there on the cattails, and she has her own type of cattails that mm -hmm. don't have to show up anywhere. What you said, it's very regional, so you want to get to know your cattails in your area, and what, you know, how to use those cattails, because they're different all over, and Aunt Helen has a black cattail that grows in her yard on the edge of the marsh, and it has, you know, similar for food, but it's just has different characteristics than anywhere else in the world, and then they're just unique. I mean, a, a lot of the water where they grow, you can go like to a, a messy water. I mean, if it's badly contaminated, then that means they're contaminated. But if it's uh, muggy, you know, muggy water and stuff, the cocktails will clean it out. Actually, you can eat them. But I mean, if it's really like polluted, polluted, like if you go by Indian Point, I wouldn't those there, but um, some if the water looks kind of dark and bad, I mean the cash tails will still be good. You know? So you try, you know, try a little bit. If, you, if um, it doesn't give you a uh, bad reaction, if it don't taste bad, then it's okay to eat. You know, if they were bad, you would taste it. It would taste sour or dirty, mm -hmm. grimy. So those are bad. You know? mm -hmm. and, and what do you use the spikes for the leaves? You use them. Yeah, you can build uh, roofs, houses, um, you can mix them with mud, and it makes the, uh, it's like mortar, almost like cement. You know, you're going to build a hut or a house or something, you can put that, mix it up in the mud, and uh, it gives it um, strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the mind. Do you, you ever weave with it? Can you yeah, you can weave with them, make baskets with them. Yeah, mats. Yeah, mats. mats. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, rope. There's all kinds of things for the leaves. Did you ever see mats made out of straight from scratch like this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's involved? That's all under. Um, you gotta peel off the shoot each leaf. You flatten it out and then weave it over, weave it over, weave it over. Yeah. And what would you get to the end? What do you do? Yeah. Oh, you can burn the ends. Burn the so, ends. Yeah, and that way they don't unwrap. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, when you think about what are some of your, you know, some of your basic needs, if you're thinking for a long period of time without. Electricity, you know, mats really are very, very useful mm -hmm. for whole time reasons. You, especially if you're, um, you know, you have torrential rains and you just want a dry area to set up anything at all. You know, mats you can string them up with rope and, mm -hmm. you know, have them over your head. So it's a good thing to learn to do. Okay, cherries, white cherries. She uh, is in Muncie or Gichi at Min. Min is berry in the language in the document. So Hitchy is great, the great berry. So cherry wood, some very hard and durable wood. I'm talking about uh, preserves and all kinds of things, you just eat them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes sour. Yes. It's not all like candy, is it? No. Um, the darker, no, I'm sorry, the lighter it is, the more sour. Mm -hmm. The darker, it's more ripe. Mm -hmm. um, what about the bark? Do you ever use the bark? No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people use the bark for their throats. Mm -hmm. You know, Smith Brothers, that's not a joke. They really use cherry bark and it really works. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to comment? This is an indigenous plant of the area, but yes. they tend to be sour. Mm -hmm. And you make preserves, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, these cherries, where, yeah. where would you look for black cherry woods? What, what kind of edges? Yeah, the, um, like the edges, like, they grow like trees. They're not, like, they're not a weed, but they're a tree. I come across them now. Yeah. The wood is very hard. It's very durable. Mm -hmm. You ever use cherry wood in any of your crafts? Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to work. It's too hard, right? Yeah. It's good furniture. Yeah, it's good furniture. It ages the lucky light after a while and get darker. Hmm. What did you say about the bark for your throat? What was that? Well, the, most trees have different health qualities from their barks. Mm -hmm. It's a whole other study. It's not in. I don't mention it in Aunt Helen or this, I have another talk about barks and how the tree barks are used. You know, and I just want to comment, you know, you hear this, oh, well, you know, several thousand species went extinct every year, and it's no big deal because species are always going extinct, but for our native people, every single species has a particular use that they use 
all the time for a particular thing. It might be health, it might be for crafts, it might be for making tools. So when every time you hear that a plant has gone extinct, in a subspecies <coughs> has gone extinct, that means some elder somewhere is probably crying because that's the only plant like it that you can use for a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And each of the trees has a bark that's used for a certain kind of medicinal quality, and it's a whole study. And of course, uh, uh, salicylic acid, I guess, is uh, aspirin, mm -hmm. and uh, that's from willow and you know white willow. Uh, that's the most famous one. Uh, what we used to do, I'm Ramon right from here, what we used to do with the bark is, we grind it up really fine and put it in a sock or something to strain it and just soak it for about five minutes in the water. And from the nutrients from the trees would actually soothe your throat like a puffed up kind of. That's kind of what it does. And some of the other trees too, like birch, we do that and get a taste of the birch and the juices. We chew on birch. Eat the flavor, but it also helps with from the saps and things that the tree helps soothe your throat. Yeah. Yeah. How do you take the bark off the tree without hurting the tree? Is there a certain most of the time when the seasons change, you'll see the bark peeling <coughs> preserve it. That way we know it's a certain time of season. Certain time of season and we go, we get it, and we just pile it up. And this is the seasonal thing, yeah. So you want to get a bunch, put it away from when you really need it. I want to mention that the yew uh, tree, mostly the western, is used, but the yew mark has, is the best anti-cancer medicine in the world. The problem is it has a lot of alkaline in it, so you probably wouldn't use it unless you really know what you're doing, because that, you know, there are things in that bark that kill you, that are, but it would cure your cancer, but then you die something else. But, <laughs> But our eastern yews can do have those anti-cancer properties, but it's even harder to extract that. If you want to study that, the Iroquois used to make uh, an alcoholic beverage out of the yews, and it would cure, you know, cancer. Um, so you know, we didn't have cancer, then. but uh, I think in the future this will be a concern. But there are other barks, and again, like I said, you can boil most of them. Most of the time you can boil the bark and get some medicinal qualities and sometimes the scum will come to the top of the pot mm -hmm. and you can take that and use it. Um, and that's mostly how we use barks. Uh, chestnuts, sagabun is an ancient Algonquin word for any ground nut. Uh, wump, theomin, again it's referring to it as a berry, but you know the people here in our region used to love chestnuts and they would, you know, burn them on coals and make a lot of smoke just like on um, Manhattan, they used to have all the guys with the chestnuts and the big uh, bins, and that was uninterrupted tradition from our Algonquin peoples in Manhattan, which is an Algonquin word, meaning uh, Rocky Island. So what about chestnuts in your childhood? Do you remember that as being like thrown in a fire or anything? No, just uh, fighting with my, we used to throw them at each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> with, the, with the spikes on or off? Yeah, both. Uh, Whoa, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well the thing is that a lot of people just, might not recognize if you're foraging, this is what you're looking for. You're not going to see this. No. You're not, you're not going to look at what to see a big pan on a you know a trolley with with these. You're going to see these. Right. And you got to break, and, and those are hard to break open. Yeah. yeah. You need it's some kind of sharp object to break them open. What do you say? They're extremely rare because they were virtually wiped out. There's, the, yeah. there's some people who've crossbred with some of the Chinese chestnuts that are. I was trying to get a hybridized version of the American chestnut back going. Those ones are all over the place. Yeah. yeah. Chinese water chestnuts, they're all up and down the Hudson. Yeah. 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 Chinese no, water Ohio. Water. Now, are they, they're as edible, aren't they? If you, the American chestnut was so prevalent throughout the forests in this region, uh, it was just everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, edible. Um, but just don't, it, it has less spikes than that. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinese. It might look like a chestnut inside, but a, a, a horse chestnut is another kind that you have to be careful of, and it's got a lot of sap in it, and they do uh, for a lot of Well, this are things we need to know about. Yeah. Are, are, so, are, are the water chestnuts that you see in the Hudson, are those, <clears throat> you, you said that those are Japanese? I think it, yeah, it's yeah. Asian water chestnuts. And are those edible, or? I, I'm not terrible? sure, I know they're ugly as sin, but. Yeah. <laughs> The Chinese chestnut is edible and they're, they're smaller and uh -huh. sweeter. And are those the one there in the Hudson? 
Um, yeah, I, I don't know what they're talking about that they're saying they're seeing in the Hudson. Well, I've seen yeah. trees. Yeah. 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 yeah, those ones with like four spikes on them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. It looks like right. Right. somebody's right. tire. Right. No, that's two different things, right. I think. You're yeah. talking about the tree. Yeah. No, those are the double swarms, and they're not indigenous. Yeah. Okay. I think they're different. Right. All right. Yeah. Double Well, they call them, the natives call them double swarms. No, they're dangerous to Anuin. Oh, yeah. Right. If you go on the water with them, you can drown easily. Yeah. So there's another chestnut that has replaced the American chestnut called yeah. the Chinese, and it's a hybrid, yeah. and you can eat the nuts. Yeah. Right, so it's a treat. Yeah. And I think that was one of those unfortunate names. So the water chestnuts, I think it's like nothing. Yeah, not right. And Native <laughs> people tend not to like those things, those uh, Japanese ones. Yeah. And then they have them in Ohio, the ones that I have eaten. Oh, uh, yeah. So deer eat them. Uh, okay, now this is a, got advice from an indigenous source. Cut down poplars and shade trees near your chestnuts, and that would apply to the Chinese. And the tree will have twice as many nuts. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you have more chestnuts that you leave on the ground, you'll get more deer. Mm -hmm. But then there, there is an extreme hazard for a harmful insect larva that infests chestnuts when they're on the ground. So you have to strike a balance. So if you harvest more chestnuts, then less deer will come. And then you can hunt more. Uh, but if you want, you know, hunt more deer, lower population, more chestnuts. Uh, so if you hunt less deer, less chestnuts on the ground. So let and less larvae. So you have you, you have the deer, you have the chestnuts, and you have the larvae, and all four are in an extremely delicate balance. So you got to remember that if you're harvesting chestnuts. <laughs> uh, turkeys like chestnuts, uh, and the word was uh, well. I, Chicken, come in, and now we have chinquapin, which are very large trees. And you see them in the, all the way across the Midwest. Chinquapin, this is a chinquapin oak. And again, an Algonquin word, frilly chestnut. Uh, got to soak those. <laughs> you got to soak them, yeah. Yeah, a lot of these nuts, especially like acorns. Any acorn you have to soak. And in my book, Native New Yorkers, uh, this book has about the whole history of the Muncie people and the Hudson Valley is a big book. Um, it's an overview. But it does mention about preparing acorns. You know, you have the green and brown, and they're, they have tannic acid, and it's very poisonous just to eat them. So never eat an acorn off the ground. Um, what you do is, you know, you mash it into a powder, and then you put it in the sun, you soak it, put it in the sun, soak it, put it in the sun, soak it, until you feel you can use it as flour. Is that any comments on Okay. So, and also, <coughs> thousands of years ago, when people, you know, th there was a lot of inventions through the last thousands of years that Native people made, like the bow and arrow didn't used to exist, and the early ancestors pretty much relied on these highly toxic nuts, acorns, and uh, they knew how to handle it. And uh, so, the places where acorns are known to be um, popular. <coughs> the natives would think of as a place of their ancestors. So they would consider that a, like a sacred grove. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the Indian corn. Yeah. As you soak the nuts and things, that's how you used to get color to different things, because you get that brown stain. So we stain our deer leather and things. So if you've got a light perch wood, you want it darker, or something, you could also soak things in it, and it would absorb the color and hold the color. You could use acorns to tan leather too, yeah. right? Yeah. The color. It just gives it the tinge, not really the tan, it just gives it the tinge with a little bit of the preserve from the acorn. Now, one thing about corn is there are a number of types of corn you can eat raw and probably should. Anybody eat raw corn? Mm -hmm. Oh good. But you know, some are easier than eat, some there's you know, there's feed grade, which are for cattle and you might not want to eat that raw. But a lot of sweet corn you should eat raw. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with it. Do you have any comments on the corn again? Kind of went through this. Yeah. Um, it's good to eat. The corn also, when you grind the corn out and get it really fine like a powder, it's also, you put a little bit of um, thickener in it, you can put it on burns, it actually absorbs from the, the oils and the heats from burns and things. Oh, like the starch? Like the starch, yeah, like the corn starch kind of thing. And we use it for our babies, and we have ratchet, rat, rashes and put it on it, and it would absorb everything. And it's a clean thing. You just rinse it off and we do it. So we really make it fine. And we use it for medical, too. We mm -hmm. also yeah. use clay in the same way. There are certain clay. grades of clay that yep. we should use for, and poultices. 
is really amazing. Certain clays more than others, but you can put them on a wound and they'll suck up all the uh, you know, indie things. Mm -hmm. And it just pulls everything out of you, you know, like, mm -hmm. the place. And then porn stars the same way. Also, of course, you know, you're going to get tired of very plain soups. And porn stars really jazzes up the soup. It gives it that almost restaurant like quality. However, you know, a lot of the corn now it has GMOs in it mm -hmm. that you see, so you want to be careful these days. So you're saying Indian corn is edible? Well, that's a good question, is it? I never eat that. Yeah, we don't normally eat that. We usually go for more like uh, decorations. So it might be misleading that it's in the, this program. I'm sorry. We use it for, uh, you make earrings out of it, you put it on your clothes. Yeah, as far as it's ever ground or not, I don't know. We have to look into that. I and mean, then maybe, maybe I should take it out of the like <laughs> Cornbread, we talked about that. And then remember that maple syrup is prevalent in our area, and so that's a major sweetener. You can use that on everything. Actually, everything you're cooking, you can add maple. Now, the, the maple water from the maple tree, the sap water, um, you know, it's drinkable. It has a lot of minerals, and it actually maple has some, maple syrup has some of the highest concentration of iron that you find. So if you're iron deficient, just you know, the fun way to address an iron deficiency is to get one of those containers of maple syrup, real maple syrup, and, and just chug it. That's I did that, yeah. and I ended up with a hangover. <laughs> but it's good going down. Yeah, right, right. Now, what I wanted to say was that the maple sugar water can make you thirsty. It's not something you want to drink while you're hiking. But if you're just kind of sitting around and eating other foods, you can drink the maple sugar water, and it tastes good. It has a sweet flavor, mm -hmm. but it actually makes you more thirsty. You can uh, cook it to boil it. Okay. And in cornbread, you can add, for example, the um, you know the maple to that for sweetener. Now the crab apple is interesting. There is an indigenous word, apelisang, for crab apple trees. And when Verrazano came to Staten Island and you know, the New York Harbor area he described Luculian apples, which are European kind of apples. So they were here, but some people say they were really crab apples, which are good to make preserves out of, but and good for cattle. But you wouldn't really want to eat a lot of it. You want to? Yeah, they're, they're uh, better. My uh, brother used to eat them when we were kids. We had one in our yard, and um, I didn't like them. And, um, my mother always said if we had, if we ate too much, it would make you sick. That you made preserves, right? Yeah. So how do you make a preserve out of this? You mash them up or you just... Yeah, she used to boil them, mash them, and all kinds of stuff. So how do you... I don't know. You boil them and then you mash them, right? And then put them in jars? Yeah, you boil them, boil them first, then you mash them down, then you can put them in jars. Also, crab apples used to be constipated. Really? Oh, yeah. Yes. Because you've got to eat a a large consumption of it, about a cup full or two, and what's in it, it gives you the runs, it pushes it out. So it's like a prune? Yeah, kind of yeah. like a prune. Okay. So my grandma, when we were constipated, so we had crab apple tray. She used to make us eat it. We just add some little, take away the bitterness, but it takes a little while, but after a while, it goes through you, and it pushes it all out, but that's what gives you a cleansing kind of constipation. So did you boil it, or? No, we just eat it, like an apple, like an apple. Just and salt it. on it? Yeah, a little bit of salt, take the bitterness away. And then how many would you have to eat? We used to eat three or four, because they're only about that big. They're not large, you know. And then that's the way we used to get rid of our constipation. Awesome. Yeah, it's all natural, and you know, it just works. Any, any acidic foods, um, and again, like tomatoes, if you're French tomatoes, salt is a base. So any time you add salt to a, a kind of a, you know, the opposite, citrusy kind of thing, like a tomato has acids in it, and it reverses the acid and makes it sweet. So sometimes salt makes things sweet. Mm -hmm. That's remember. Mm -hmm. uh, cranberries, mm -hmm. very big uh, native foods. Mm -hmm. And people, not as popular as it used to be, I suppose, but peckamin in the Muncie area and nibamin mm -hmm. in the Wapagers area. And very associated with Native Americans, you know, a lot of the food you think of that you eat at Thanksgiving, you know, Maybe when you were kids, you were told, well, the pilgrims had these foods, and the starving Indians came, and they fed the Indians, and they were so great. <laughs> uh, the foods we eat at Thanksgiving are all the American foods that we're growing right here, and so it was the pilgrims who were stealing the corn from out, so the, the bins they were storaging 
Underground, that's where you store things. Underground, lime pits, right? right. And cover it, and the pilgrims are getting in there, and even the corn. Oh, you guys must be really bad off. See, you're stealing a corn. That's terrible. We feel so bad for you. Mm -hmm. Here, have some deer meat. Have some turkey. You want to talk about cranberries now? Um, let's see. Cranberries used as a medicine too for urinary tract infection and things right. like that. The cranberry, the nutrition in the cranberry and the acids and stuff actually help plunge you out to get rid of urinary infection. So my grandma always used to make us drink one glass a week to help keep everything out. And so Did you boil it. She used to mash it up and boil it like a tea, and then we'd set it outside and we drink it lukewarm. You just take like an old sock. She always used old socks for everything. We strain everything it's the easiest sucks. way, you know? So we strain it, and then we drink the juices out of there, and then she take the cranberries and mash them up, and add sometimes the root that you've seen, the cattail root, we'd have potatoes. We call them potatoes and cranberries, the same thing. We'd mix that together to get a little bit of flavor. Okay. They're good and raw, too. Oh, yeah. you, know, you ever just pick one to do it? Probably spit to have that work. Yeah, if you pick them off the bush, they'll probably spit out part of it. That's when it's not helpful. It's not really a will hurt you. Just oh, dandelion is not really indigenous, but many people have been using dandelion since contact. And the roots, see the little arrow. These things are like walnuts. They're really fun to eat. And of course, you probably all have had dandelion leaves in your salads, but. But the roots are like walnuts, and they're really, really nutritious. They clean them. They bring the paper. Any comments on that? Yeah, it's good salad. We need to eat. I feed them to my lizards, and we eat them in the house. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look at all the different things that are in the dandelion leaves. Mm -hmm. um, but talk about vitamins and minerals A, C, K, and calcium, potassium, iron, and manganese. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, in the spring, and it's also don't pick the, the dandelions from right next to the super highway because they absorb toxins. So you want to step back a bit from the road. But they they're full of all kinds of. Uh, that, that's what it, that's what anything dark, anything that you want to eat. <laughs> don't, don't pick it off by the road. Try to go away from the road to get it. If you see it, you know, if you see the dandelion, oh, stop the car, get out now. Walk inward and get it. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times the roads, the, uh, all those plants along the roads are contaminated because they get the runoff from the salt, from the rain, from the oil, and all that. And exhaust. Yeah. And exhaust, how, right. They're how do you good prepare the roots? The same thing with the root. Yeah. How do you prepare them? You cook them or you just eat them? Yeah, cook them. Yeah, you boil them. Yeah. You boil them. Yeah. 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 I eat the beans. Boil them. Mm -hmm. Salt them. Uh, you boil them. I think you pick the bottom off. It's like picking a berry, yeah. and then you boil them for a while, and they get softer, and then you just eat them. Mm -hmm. Also, you can take the juices from the dandelion, and you let it sit for a while, and it makes wine. Yeah. Also, the, the flour. The flour, yeah. flour. The flour part of the dandelion too. My grandma used. It takes mosquitoes away. You rub it on you, and it actually keeps the mosquitoes away. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Like Not everyone, but most of the majority of mosquitoes actually stay away. You take the head, the flour, wow. rub it on the yellow, the yellow part. The, the yellow part. part. And that's the other way you eat it too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> dandelions and plantain both, you know, are early introduced plants that natives adopted, and if you eat the plantain and chew it and chew you know dandelion mm -hmm. that that alone will repel bugs too. Yeah, because it comes out because you sweat. It comes out mm -hmm. So if you eat the leaves or the yellow, mm -hmm. you eat the yellow, the flower, the leaves, yeah. The flower. And also with plantain, if you chew on the plantain heads, the, those little microphones on the plantain. Cilium. Yeah. yeah, then that will come through your system and the bugs will stay away. How many do you have to eat? <laughs> Not many. It depends on the how ambitious the body is. You have to do it all the time. I mean, if you go outside tonight, just eat one, it's right. not going to work. But if you eat a lot of them over time, Building it up then in your right, it has to build up in your system. Just rub them on. It's the best what you used to do to us. You take arms and rub the top of the rub it on your skin. Rub it on your skin. So the dandelion and plantain are somewhere in that way. But again, my Aunt Helen used plantain that she picked it near the road and she got sick from the pollution. That would even in 1900. But uh, yeah, but one thing I would mention that the plants like this and trees, 
they absorb um, a huge amount of the exhaust from cars and actually help keep us alive, even as we speak, as you're walking around and walking down the highway, you know, and you sense some, you smell some pollution, but if it wasn't for these kind of plants, certain kind of plants, they're sucking in pounds every year of, of mercury and cadmium and all these things that cars actually put out. And so they keep us alive, but if you eat those ones near the road, you're eating the stuff they're trying to save you from. So they go, oh, damn it. But these, these, we see the arrows, that, that root is really good, like I say, it's like walnuts. Okay, now dot greens are edible. Again, there's the things people knock down with their, with their weed whackers and whatnot. Everything that you mow down or knock down in your yard, all of it cures cancer. Just know that. So uh, these are good. Uh, served with potatoes, cornbread, eaten with marshmallow golds, A, vitamin A. Uh, you want to talk about this, how to use them in uh, a challenge? Yep, just a couple of up. Washing them off. Well, not the, what do you do with the upper parts? I don't remember. Not the, harvest not the the goes, uh, Just the leaves you want. Well, we, har we harvest the top piece, yeah. right? Collect all the seeds in the winter time. Yeah. And then we use them in like our uh, morning like oatmeal or cereal. Because really? it has yeah. a, it has a lot of iron and protein. Yeah, yeah, protein. Yellow Doc actually tells us that there's a lot of iron in our soil. Yeah, so oh. we have a high mineral content. Iron. And without iron, you know, you really start it's to not, feel sick. not hard? What, the seed? Well, it would be seeds. like if you were eating a psyllium seed from yeah. the plantain. You know, you soak them, you cook them like your nuts. Okay. You know, yeah. any type of seed. So you boil those and you eat them? No, we just we do them in the winter time. You clean all the, the shells off of them and you collect all the seeds. Very tedious job. So, okay. you know, you want to do it when, you know, the weather isn't, you know, very nice out, so we sit around, we peel all the little shells off, we get a bag of little seeds, wow. and then we save them, and then we cook them in our um, oatmeal or farina for the morning. Well, so there's the seeds in the picture, right? Yep. They're blown up. Yep. Really tiny. Yeah, I wondered about that. Thank you, I, have, well, yeah. I personally wondered that. Mm -hmm. So now you know. Mm -hmm. I like oatmeal, so I don't want oatmeal. Oh, you want to Okay, now duckweed is actually, it's a food, <laughs> and uh, you see it, and it's that picture is like how you usually see it, it's like that scum that looks terrible on the yeah. ponds, and in mm -hmm. fact, that particular kind of plant is edible, and it's high in vitamin C. Is that algae? Well, no, we, yeah, it's like an algae. It's like, it looks like algae, it's not. <coughs> and it well, smells bad sometimes. Is it like plankton, you know, in the oceans? Or More like super blue-green things? That no, are, this is all lakes, we'll see them. Or they're tiny, the side of by the river. They're actually tiny little individual yeah, leaves. Leaf 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 yeah. And you can eat them. And they feel like dope weed. It tastes like a super food. Yeah, it does. How many more people don't? Aren't you hip for that? Yeah. Oh, Look at it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It does look like a filet of no. milk. Does it? Right. So you get out with your, you know, you go out there with bags and you, you know, put them in. First of all, make sure the ducks are eating them. Right. Make sure you get the right thing and then you put them in the bag. Well, I mean, it's. Is there a difference between that, 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 uh, what's it called? Duck weed. Duck weed. I, 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 I was going to say ducks, duck scum, but. Is there a difference between that on a lake and that in a swampy area? You know, where it wouldn't be as good in a, uh, in a still swampy area as I would go with the pond. Same, so. same thing, but uh, it probably tastes better. It tastes worse in the swamp, because the okay. swamp has a tendency to rot more stuff from the high uh, heat and the stuff in the water. Right. Yeah, that's kind of Yeah. Well, how do you know the difference between good duck? Weeds. Watch the duck. If it's bright green like this, yeah. this is good. Like so this. all bright green it, right. no. algae? It, like no, 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 not all of them. No, it's, no, it's brown, little tiny round leaves in the duck. It's the little leaves. Like all this looks like just green, but if you look at it close, it's like this little specks. Well, it sounds like a good soup or something. Yeah. You can take a strainer and say, yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to get somebody to go do it with you. That's what I'm going to do. But if it's brown, I mean, right. So watch the ducks. The ducks eat it. What is there any? What kind of preparation would be involved? Would you boil that off before eating? I mean, no, you can eat it just like that.
rinse it off? Yeah. I mean, nowadays you, you know, yeah. rinse it off. But I think in the early days, you probably just leave it. Yeah, you just leave it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, elderberries, you hear a lot about these days in the radio and, you know, in books about how good elderberries are. Good for your immune system. I have found, though, that sometimes when you're already sick, it can create a kind of a health kickback, a kind of a, might seem to make it worse at first. But, you know, they're good for preventing colds before you get them. And, of course, you have elderberry wine and jam and People say that, like, for example, I don't know if anybody here with Bruderhoff, but I know the Bruderhoffs are really heavily into native foods, and they swear by elderberries because they're all living close together, and they don't tend to get sick. And they have various kinds of elderberry preparations, so if you really want to get into elderberries, go over to one of the Bruderhoffs and ask them how they do it, because they're real experts on it. Have you ever, ever used elderberries? And they definitely work. Now, uh, Phil had ferns. I was going to go to the store. Right now, some of the stores sell little head ferns, and they are delicious. They're just like um, asparagus, and uh, they're featured in my Aunt Helen's little herb book, and she was saying, have you, he asked me once when I was interviewing her, he said, have you ever eaten the, the scroll head ferns, the fill head ferns up on the Ross Road? And I was thinking, Ross Road? Yeah, I know where that is. I said, no, I never eaten those fiddleheads. She said, well, you never lived then, did you? <laughs> and she was right. But now you can, you don't have to go to the Ross Road in Scarborough, Maine. You can go to certain groceries this time of year for about three weeks. You can get them. They're covered with uh, cellophane, and you buy them. They're not really cheap, but it's worth it. you got to experience the fiddlehead. And generally in Maine, what we do is uh, we do, you know, Big Macs. Put them in a pan and put lots of butter in, and you flip them, and you, you just sear them with that. You can eat them raw. I did a workshop. Uh, over in Westchester, and I brought, it was just the right day, and I brought a whole big pile of fiddleheads, and everybody ate fiddleheads as part of the workshop, and nobody got sick. So, so any firm fiddleheads? No, no, only a certain kind. Okay. So, when, if you're harvesting them, you really should have somebody with you who knows what they're doing. But the ones that have a Hannaford, it's not to mention any names or any. I'm not testing that. But I think Hannaford's does sell them, and so those ones you know are good. And once you start having the experience of eating fiddleheads that have been selected by herbologists, and Hannaford's are good, then you'll get the taste, you'll get the look, and when you go out, you'll recognize them. But a lot of herbalists do not recommend people go and gather their own fiddleheads because people tend to pick up this other kind of fern that really doesn't look that much like it, but it does make a fiddlehead shape, but it doesn't have the meat. See, this is an amazing plant because this is a meaty kind of asparagus-like stock that continues to be thick right to the center. And when you, you flip them and you sear them in butter, you know, you, you've got a lot of food there. It's like asparagus that's, you know, inter rolled up. And uh, so what people see when they think, oh, it's going to be easy, I'll go out and get fiddleheads, and they'll see a fern that curls up, but there's no meat like that. And that's a terrible thing to eat. <laughs> so it's more butter. So, in Wapinter is the word is masozi, so that's our local word. You know this is an indigenous plant. It does grow. It's, if you like asparagus, by the way, I highly recommend this time of year to eat raw asparagus. Later on, it's not as good. But raw asparagus and is like fiddlehead. It has tremendous amounts of minerals and vitamins. It's like a medicine. It tastes great. So everybody uh, preferred sandy soil and shade. Or you can freeze them, by the way. We <coughs> have freezers. Mm -hmm. uh, any other? Some uh, salads, uh, raw, raw like that too. But I never tried it raw like that. Yeah, I recommend there's certain ones that are much better raw. And one of the things too is, do you ever have asparagus and then had a drink of water? Mm -hmm. What happens? Mm -hmm. Anybody? It's pee, stinky pee. Well, it's stinky as a matter of taste. <laughs> but, yeah, but what, how does the water taste after eating asparagus? It tastes sweet, right? Yeah. Eat some asparagus, drink some clear water, and the water will taste sweet. A lot of asparagus taste. The same thing with a fiddlehead. You eat a fiddlehead, and then you drink fresh water, and the water will have a sweet taste. So, you know, it's a good thing to, to do. It's nice, it's more fun to drink water after. <coughs> These are very closely related 
And again, some, some workshops I bring a big thing of fiddle heads and show them to everybody and we eat them raw and so far nobody's gotten sick. Okay, and again, this time of year, asparagus, when it's right out of the ground, same day. It's like raw milk. How many people drink raw milk? I've had it. Okay, that's good. I've had it while it's still warm out of the udder. Yeah, yeah, that's, I get it, and... Um, With the flies buzzing around the pail. <laughs> you got to have the flies, otherwise you don't know what's the real thing. But, but yeah, if you drink it within a day, you know, it's great. And it, it boosts your immune system. And by the way, I'll just mention, cows aren't indigenous. I don't know. <laughs> we get upset, but we had you know other things. But cow's milk is um, has the three um, uh, thermal labiles in it that as soon as they pasteurize it, it kills all the good stuff in it. So it's pretty useless to drink after they pasteurize it. But if you can get it raw, it builds your immune system. That's why mother's milk builds the immune system of babies. And so in our system of life, the babies drink from the mother's breast, and awesome. they. What? Colostrum. Colostrum, but there's the thermal labels in that, and that builds the immune system. Mm -hmm. so, you know, it's more than more detail. And then you're healthy for life. It goes till about 60 years old, and then it builds up your glutathione, and then it starts to deplete after 60. It's pretty good system, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas in this culture, we don't breastfeed, and then we give them the Similac, and then you go and homogenize milk, and you never get your immune system to really build up. So this is part of how. You know, if you're thinking survival, generations, you want your family to live for years, make sure that the breastfeeding happens and that you're drinking raw cow's milk. And it takes that six times the amount of cow's milk to equal the same amount of mother's milk, by the way, in terms of the immune system. And the immune system is key. You know that, you know, the thing that people say, oh, Native Americans, they didn't have it right because what if they get an infection? And then what do they do? Well, actually, there's a lot of answers to that because they wouldn't get the infection. And if they did, there are ways we, have, we know. We gave it to them. <laughs> yeah, right. A lot of them. Yeah. Some of it. Yeah. So anyway, if you read what's up here, there's a couple of things. You can eat the roots and certain preparations. Filbert nuts. Um, Filberts are indigenous, by the way, and that's why people eat them at Thanksgiving to honor the Native Americans. They're related to hazelnuts. And uh, there's words for that. I don't know if you ever saw Powell Highway. The main character is called Filbert and it's trying to tell you something. He's an indigenous nut. Okay. Can you say that yeah, um, High crust. High crust. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we grow up eating the mm -hmm. Now, sumac is very famous <coughs> among Native people as, as a, a tonic, glabra mm -hmm. sumac, and they make lemonade out of it. Mm -hmm. It's of the staghorn sumac only. That's the only kind. That I understand you might, am I right? The staghorn sumac is the one that's made it, in the pipe, and the roasted leaves are mixed with tobacco, and um, it's a mixture tree, mm -hmm. and the staghorn is used that way, but they also make lemonade out of the glabra cement. Mm -hmm. So that's common, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So and if you, uh, if you smoke it, it'll, it'll push you to sleep. Yeah. Sumac? Yeah, sumac berries. Just the berries. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that the leaves gives you the poison ivy? No, stuff? that's a whole different plant. Yeah. Well, poison, all the calamine says for poison ivy and sumac. It's a different type. Yeah. Yeah. Poison it's poison poison. Oh. No, there's lots of kinds of sumac. Yeah, it's all so different kinds. I don't even think they're related to poison yeah. sumac. It's just, it looks yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah. call it poison yeah. sumac. A lot of the yeah. common terminology is just very misleading. <laughs> Okay, so the glabra sumac is the only one to make lemonade out of, and the staghorn is the one to make the pipe stem out of, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and there's all these other kinds of sumacs, but they use them very commonly for tools and, you know, it'd be different kinds of things hard. when they're hard enough. So you use sumac for a lot of different things. Any more you're in cover right here. Which, which part do you, uh, the, the red part or the, the stem? The red. The red. The right, right. 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 to make the tools out? No, the lemon. No, the lemon. Oh, yeah, the lemon. It'll feel sticky. Yeah, this stuff. Okay. So tell us exactly how to make the lemon. You've got to put it in the uh, You've got to break it down, mash it up, put it in the uh, water. You don't have to boil it, do you? No. No boil it. It's like rhubarb. You put rhubarb in water and just let it sit. And let it sit. You don't have to filter it. You can filter it out, though, because, you know, it's kind of hard to drink like that with all the little leaves. Some people don't like it. But if you filter it out in just the water, it's good. So hak, hak and na min, min is dairy, and <laughs> kahak is <laughs> geese or goose. Kahak 
it's Kahenamen is a variation on Kahenamen. You've heard of Kerhans in New York, it means the place of the wild geese. And Kahenamen is the gooseberry. Do you have any? I've never really eaten them, so. No. No. But they're edible. Hickory nuts. We have a lot of shag bark mm -hmm. over in Dutchess County, famous for that. And that's the hickory nuts that go with them. And they're, again, when you're looking at them in nature, you see them like this. You see the shell. You don't see this, so you got to know what you're looking for. And the bark is very distinctive. So you look for the bark of the shag bark, and you know that they'll have the nuts that you want. Pegang is a, a Canarsi word, that's what C represents, for hickory nuts. And I understand from colonial records that hickories, and also from John Burroughs, that the hickory is good for bees if you're into bee, um, what do they call it, apiary stuff, if you want honey. Again, it's still possible, even after the grid collapses, you still should be able to make honey, right? Mm -hmm. If your bees don't collapse. And uh, it's hickory, they seem to like hickory trees. Mm -hmm. And lots of different things they can pollinate. Do you have any comments on hickory? Did you ever see? No. Because they're on all that one. We got a ton of them in, uh, in, on Del, in the Del Del Lakes area. Where's that? Uh, Warwick. Warwick. We have some in our backyard. Uh, and you're in residence. Yeah, for, have you ever try them? You ever try to cut them up? Yeah, I don't know. Okay, I also want to mention the wood of the hickory is very durable and great for tools. So you got a, you have a way to saw them and carve them or whatever. You can make some excellent bow and arrows, right? Yep. And hickory. hickory. And other, you know, old hickory, remember, it's like use it for things that you really need a firm wood for. Mm -hmm. Hickory light bows and arrows. Mm -hmm. Oh, the shaft of the arrow. Mm -hmm. We talk about honey and hickories again for the nuts, but to attract bees, we use honey, uh, honey trees. And uh, generally it's about 100, 100 yards, people say, within the tree. And it manipulates the taste. The sunflower has a taste, wildflower, buckwheat. Blueberries give it a certain flavor. Raspberry and what? Alfalfa. Alfalfa. That's the basic, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to talk about barks, and again I'll speak as a Micmac. We had something called the Great Medicine, Uxium Pisun, which has alum bark, hornbeam, beech, wild willow, wild black cherry, ground hemlock, and red spruce. And if you put all those barks in the pot and you boil them all, that whatever you got, you don't need to get a, a, a what do you call it, a diagnosis. Just uh, eat that great medicine, and whatever you had, it's probably going to be here. <laughs> you know, saved you all that money and then go out of here. So uh, one thing about the red spruce, I had uh, Lyme disease. I had a very advanced case, and um, I went in, and the doctor said, oh, you know, this is so exciting. You're the worst case I ever saw. I <laughs> and so I want to get you tested right away, but I can give you this medicine right away. So you have to be tested and you're so excited. You have this high score, it's so high, I'm so excited. It's, you know, it's a very high score, which men's up going to die, you know. So I, went to, <laughs> so I went to my medicine man up in that country, and he gave me red spruce. Um, again, you know, you boil it like a bark. It was the berries. It was the little cones, the tiny little cones. And the scum comes to the top, and then you take the scum and you drink it. And I, oh. I got really much better within days. Oh, days. Wow. Okay. It has stuff in it that's just not in anything else. So, but this is bark, and the bark has a similar quality. You see deer eating bark, too. And the Adirondack people were famous for eating bark because there isn't a lot else to eat. They could survive sometimes by eating bark. It was just filling their stomachs, but they would actually eat it. And the medicine would keep them alive. Do you have any comments on bark? Yeah, it's the best thing on survival. It's a good survival trait. Mm -hmm. Huckleberries are very, very common around this area, and the natives were well known to gather them. And some of the kind of mixed bloods still gather the huckleberries, right? And uh, they're not blueberries. You do not want to just expect them to be blueberries because they have their own personalities, mm -hmm. and they're very seedy, right? Mm -hmm. You want to talk about uh, the huckleberries? Um, you don't like that, but the um, wild. It's hard to explain how it tastes. They're gamey. They're gamey. Lots of, lots of okay. seeds. Mm -hmm. But uh, ten little divisions inside. 
whereas blueberries are all, you know, one whole thing. Right. They're darker, but they're good food, and you can cook them, right? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. probably the best thing to do is cook them and make uncle very high. Mm -hmm. Now, this is something, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, Indian yeah. cucumber, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It has a little bottom to it. So what, I don't know, in terms of what part to eat, I'm not sure I have this on the next slide. Oh, yeah, here we go. So you look at the root, it's not Indian. There's an Indian cucumber from India, and this isn't it. This is Mendiola virginiana, mm -hmm. uh, lily family. The tubers you can eat raw like carrots. The flowers hang down from the leaves, which are about 18 inches off the ground. So you see these? Mm -hmm. up, up in the air, you get these little hanging down leaves. But these are like carrots, and Indians used to eat them. Yep. I don't know if like that. Did you ever have them? You ever bought them? Collect them? No, when I was little, but I never bought them. They taste like uh, turnips. Turnips. Yeah. They have a swamping area. Swamping, yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. are, aren't you supposed to be able to identify that by the number of leaves and the type of leaves, the, the, the sawtooth or, or something about the leaves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got to be really they careful with that one. Courses you can take, you know, pick them up. And it's only, it doesn't grow very high, it's usually about a foot or so off the ground. Mm -hmm. More than a foot. It's high mm -hmm. enough to your knee. It's not serrated. Uh, no, they have the, uh, what do they call that? The, uh, there's a word for that kind of leaf. But here they are. It's like six leaves that are um, not serrated, but they're uh, teardrop shaped. Okay, now again, anytime you're talking about mushrooms, you want to have a trained professional, Tom Brown, right next to you. Okay, You don't eat the wrong ones, but I do know people who are still alive who gather mushrooms, and they're very good. And they tend to grow up quickly, and in some of these marshy areas, on Helen, you still like them. But, uh, oh, let's talk about that. You want to comment about mushrooms? Is there a particular kind that, that you've cozied up to? No. Because they make you sick. Yeah, the wrong ones that do make, make you sick. sick. It's hard to tell. Uh, my brother ate, ate them when he was a kid. And, um, he was in the hospital for two days. And they don't know what kind he ate. So that was the hard part. If they, you know, if they could have known what he ate, then they could have did it, but um, they didn't know what he ate. Yeah. In Texas, they used to get them out, go pick them out of cow patties. Were they those are the good ones, right? Yeah, you don't want to put that in your spaghetti. <laughs> no. no, yeah, and, and I think that, again, it's a whole study. I do know people who have mastered, mm -hmm. um, what do they call it? There's a word for. Mycography, mycology. If you eat the little ones, you know the little ones like that are better to eat than the big sloppy looking ones. They say because the big floppy looking ones are the, are the ones that are bad for you, bad for you. Yeah. But they say like the little small ones are better for you. Mm -hmm. Now you know when, when you hear about getting a uh, um, hold of something bad in the woods, vegetables and things like that, normally it's almost um, cliche, you know, bad mushroom, right? Uh, but yeah. what what about are there any other um, like cause I'm I'm looking at all these pictures of these different plants you've had up here and I don't know that I would recognize it if I went out into the you know what I'm saying well, right exactly and and I let me sometimes I say this at the beginning of the program mm -hmm. this is the, the very introduction it's a long long journey mm -hmm. to foraging and you should go on several workshops with people out in the woods yeah this is more of a winter version usually. And, and again, Tony's stories help, I think, inspire people. You need to be motivated. What I'm trying to do here, and what Tony's trying to do, is motivate you to go on this long journey, which for most of us is the lifetime journey, to really identify. One thing to understand that Native people lived off the land without electricity or without you know, shipping and trucking. Another thing is to be able to identify them even after their picks. But to go into the wilderness and spot them and identify, say, like a wild carrot from another kind of carrot, very important to know and also very difficult. Mm -hmm. But this is essential. There's really no other way to forage. And, e and even if you do get some, I say we're talking about the dandelions or the mushrooms, oh, if they're good, but then it might take a while for you to get adjusted to it. You know, it might be okay to eat, right? You know, it might be great to eat, but if you're not adjusted to it, it'll make you sick. Huh. One thing, one thing that you should do is if you're foraging 
not short. You always taste, just touch your tongue to the plant and don't eat any of it, just lick it. And then wait and see what happens to your tongue. That doesn't prevent you from getting sick. I'm just saying that foragers taught me that. They said, lick it, taste it, but you don't. Even, you know, take a little piece off and chew it and swallow it. Yeah, you go in stages. You know, don't take the whole thing, no. 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 You go very slowly with each plant. But especially with mushrooms, I wouldn't recommend anybody forage mushrooms unless you really have extensive no. training. Just go in by them. Some mushrooms, it could be next week before we find out it was a bad one. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. Be very, very careful. Okay. Indian fern, I'm not an expert, I don't know. But this is an Indian fern and they're edible. Okay, Jack in the Pulpit, this is one, you know, the word Takaho, you've heard of Takaho, New York. Mm -hmm. That is a word for the, the Jack in the Pulpit, which is also called the Indian Turnip. Mm -hmm. And that's again because of the, the root is very, and there's a berry too. Mm -hmm. And uh, the root is very, you know, a little peppery, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's turnipy. Mm -hmm. And when times were tough, they would rely on eating this food uh, as part of their meals. Do you want to comment on um, the soups are good. This part is good. The stuff, the water, the juice inside, they say, you know, if you wipe it out, wash it out, and then, you know, catch water with it, it's fine. But if you walk up in the forest and just see that like that, it's full of water, don't drink the water because something probably died in there, bugs and stuff has been sitting in there. You know, but, um, the shoots are okay. I had the but mainly the, the food is the root itself, and mm -hmm. it's like turnip, and it's a highly prized as, as food by early ancestors, you know, when there wasn't a lot of food. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, whenever you eat a root of a plant, you're killing the plant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to remember that and offer tobacco with our tradition, we'd offer something back. And we would not mm -hmm. ever eat the last one as we're harvesting roots, because the killing the whole plant and the entire community of plants so they can't regenerate. So you just, especially when a, a tuber situation, just eat some of them. But these grow in down in the banks of streams and whatnot. So here's the root. Right there, that's what they look like. Very small. Bit nutritious. Now Jerusalem artichoke has root that is like potatoes. And I had some just the other day. Where was that? Oh yes, over at the uh, Really big farms. We had some, somebody brought some Jerusalem artichokes. A little firm, you know, but excellent. Uh, more flavorful than potatoes are kind of a staple.